Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this moment. Lord, you've known about this opportunity that this particular space represents right where we are, whether in the sanctuary or in our homes, at work, in our cars, wherever we find ourselves right now. And so, Lord, we ask that we would bring what we need to bring, that our hearts would be open, our ears would be open, our minds would be open, that we would not be rigid against what the Spirit seeks to do in our lives right now, right now. We're looking for a rhema word that's applicable right now. Thank you for yesterday's blessings and last week's blessings. But right now we need a rhema word from you. And so, Lord, I ask that you would speak with my mouth, think with my mind. Lord, our objective is not to just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. So that when it's all said and done, we would hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And then... We get to see what's next. Have your God-like way in this moment. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. My, my, my. All right. Here's where we are. I, I, I think I noticed a change last week here in sunny Southern California towards the end of the week. You know us. You know us. I've often commented on it before. We recognize, for those of you that may be in different parts of the nation and experience weather a little differently than we do, I realize I'm a born and bred SoCal kid. I get it. So I noticed a change. We went from averaging like 75 type degree weather to 65, and we had to pull out the sweaters. We had to pull out the sweaters, right? There was a change in the season that was pretty demonstrative for us. No, we don't have snow and sleet and all that kind of stuff, at least where we are. But there was a change in the season. And what that change signifies for us, in part at least, is it is getting towards the end of the year. And yes, we don't have as much of the 80 degree and 70, high 70 degree weather. We, we, we get a little more balmy. For us, it's cold. I had to pull out my knit hat. Those of you that are in other parts of the country are laughing. I get it. Laugh away. I get it. I don't know about that snow thing. I don't understand that. That's not my experience. So when it gets a little bit, just a little bit into the mid and low 60s, that's a severe issue even for me. Yes. Amen. And so we're entering into the season that as we come to this part of the year in the fourth quarter, we start to think about Thanksgiving. We start to think of this is the time when turkeys start getting nervous and so forth. We're, we're in a different season now. And, and so especially with what's going on in our uh, world and in our nation, um, we need to be thinking about gratitude and thanksgiving. We need to be thinking about this. It's much more than just a polite thing to do to say thank you, right? It's much more than just a, a, a proper thing, an appropriate thing to do that we teach our children uh, um, when we get something that we like and we're excited about it, not to just run off without a proper a proper acknowledgement uh, of whoever gave it to you, showing great uh, gratitude and, and thanks. But um, this is something that we need to examine a little closer. And I think it's just appropriate, even more so, as I just noted, that there's a number of folks who took the time to vote who are a little more excited on today, but there's also a number of folks who took the time to vote who are a little saddened today. And no matter where we fall, we need to make sure that we're being grateful, that we're finding the silver lining of whatever our various situations are, and we're saying, Lord, I thank you for that. Yes, there is a cloud, but there's a silver lining that because I'm connected to you, I can say thank you. Because I am connected to Christ, I can walk in a spirit of gratitude because the almighty God died on a cross and settled my salvation a long time ago. And now I get to walk and grow in him as I'm being sanctified. I can say thank you and walk in a spirit of contentment no matter what's going on. Now, here's the thing. I have to be honest with you. If you be honest with me, I'm going to be honest with you. This is not something that's done naturally. It's not something that's done naturally. As I just alluded to, you have to train that child 
They get a lollipop or something. They're so excited. They're off running. Thank you. Th thank you is not what comes out of their mouth. They're off eating it and having a good time. You give them a toy. They're off to the races. You have to slow them down and say, what do we say? We say thank you. And we have to teach this. This is not a thing that necessarily comes naturally as it were. In fact, breaking news Breaking news, in case you haven't gotten it by now, you've been walking with Christ any amount of time, or there may be some of us who are considering getting closer to Christ. Here, here's, here's something I want you to kind of think about. Life in Christ is simply learning how to go against what you naturally want to do until you are able to do that which you do not want to do more naturally. Let me say that again. <laughs> Life in Christ is learning how to go against what you naturally want to do until you are able to do that which you do not want to do more naturally. You can reference Romans 7 to have some fun with that tongue twister. So you and I don't naturally come out as individuals who are naturally uh, um, in a state of contentment. We are not naturally um, thankful. We are not naturally grateful as things unfold around us. We know how to be grateful when things happen that tickle our spirits, that bring us joy and make us smile. But you and I are not a people who naturally start off in a spirit of gratitude when things hit the fan of our lives and stuff is splattered all over the place. And we begin to say, what in the world is happening and why? The last thing sometimes is on, that's on our mind is saying thank you when things are going chaotic. When things are in a state of chaos, the last thing that's on our mind sometimes is to be able to say thank you. Least of all to say thank you, Lord. And so what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks is we're going to be exploring this topic. Um, if, if you can go to that slide. But can we say thank you, Lord. Can we say thank you, Lord? And in fact, we're going to go a little bit further. We're going to say, can we say thank you, Lord, when? When? And the scripture for this series that we're going to kind of walk through today to kind of lay a foundation is 1 Thessalonians 5.18. And I just want to talk about it before we go to it for just a moment. Here's what's happening in Thessalonians. Paul has gone on his second missionary journey. This place, Thessalonians, is a real physical place. It is not a mythological location. It is located in northern Greece, right? And, and here's what happened. It was founded by a, a Macedonian king named Cassander in uh, 315 B.C. And here's what this, this king is so smooth. Brothers, listen to me. Husbands out here, listen to me. Listen to me how smooth this king Cassander was. When he conquered the city, he named the city after his wife, Thessalonike. <laughs> right? King uh, uh, Alexander the Great's half-sister is who he was married to. Her name was Thessalonike, I think I'm saying it right. Those that are Greek scholars, forgive me. I'm just bludgeoning it, right? But he named the city after his wife, Thessalonike. N-I-K-E is how it ends, right? And so this became, uh, uh, there, this was a Macedonian city from its inception in 315 up until about 168 B.C. when the Roman Republic took things over. And this is a, a critical location. Here's why. Because it was, it was a, a thoroughfare for trading between Europe and Asia. This is a real, live, historical place, right? It's important that we understand. It's important that we get that these aren't mythological places. They are places that, in many times, you can still go and visit even to this day. This was a prosperous city, right? As it became a, a, a trade center for the Roman Republic between Europe and Asia, this, this allowed for this place to become very prosperous. It had amphitheaters complete with uh, competitions and gladiators uh, uh, sports and, and games. And it actually even had its own circus, if you can get ready for that. Early in Paul's secondary uh, missionary journey, uh, somewhere between 49 and 52 uh, A.D., now Christ has died, and now he's on his journey. So we're, we're, we've gone from B.C. into A.D. now. It took him to Thessalonica. He, he landed in this place. 
And I'm going to read for you just a moment um, a little bit about what sets us up for our particular scripture. But in essence, he spent three weeks there debating and sharing and preaching and teaching about how Jesus was the promised Messiah. Uh, the people actually believed. There were Jews who believed. There were Greeks who believed. And they believed so uh, uh, heartily that it disrupted things. It caused a literal ruckus during that time. And he would end up writing to Thessalonica from Corinth around about, again, 50 A.D. And I want to just read some of this because, again, reading the word is good. And in order for us to understand what's happening in Thessalonica or Thessalonians in the scripture that we're going to read, I want to give you a little backdrop, a little cult, a context uh, um, as far as what's going on. So let's read this together. It's only going to be 10 verses. It's not a lot. It's not a lot, I promise. When Paul and his, command, and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, uh-oh. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, got them a little gang, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house. He was staying at Jason M. house. That's where Paul and Silas had went. They were staying at Jason Nim house. And, and, and they, since they couldn't get to them, they went to Jason Nim to kind of get after them. They rushed to Jason Nim's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. They made Jason and the others post bond and then let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish, uh, Jewish synagogue, all right? And so that is the story of what's going on. See, he went to Berea, then from there he kept going. He ended up landing in uh, Corinth. And when he was in Corinth, that's when he began to write because he had to get out of there so quickly. There was excitement that the church was growing in Thessalonica, that, that here these group of individuals, there were the, the Jewish believers, the Greek believers, and some prominent women that got that thing going, and it, start, it stirred up such a ruckus that they had to abruptly get out of there. And so he's thinking in a pastorly way, if you'd allow me, to how, how can I make sure and connect with them? How can I make sure and talk with them? How can I make sure to encourage them as they continue to grow? He ended up sending Timothy back, and then ultimately Timothy met with him and gave him a report that said, in spite of the persecution that's going on, they are thriving. They are thriving there. And here is where he begins to pin Thessalonians. It's amazing how as we keep studying in the word and we can get understanding about what's happening in one particular text by going to another. And here, here's just kind of a bonus thought that I want you to, to kind of take with you. When you threaten people's prosperity, expect to be prosecuted. This is just a, a kind of a random point. As they got in there, they disrupted the whole system. They came in and for three weeks laid out arguments such that some Jews, Greeks, and prominent women said, this is something that we need to, this, this makes sense. We believe they got on board. They were all in and it stirred things up. And folks, some folks, as you saw, got jealous. And as they got jealous, it just set a whole bunch of events off that lands him having to get out of the city and get to another space where he's safe. And it's from ultimately going through Berea and one, other, one or two other spots, he lands in Corinth. And right around 50, 51, somewhere in that 
uh, uh, time frame uh, A.D., he writes this letter. And as a part of this letter, he gives some very explicit information. He celebrates, but then he encourages and admonishes in a very pastorly way, right? I want us to read this scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. It's picking up midway in a sentence. That's why you see a lowercase g as we begin to read. Um, there are some other things that are before that, but I'm trying to be disciplined and not have you here for so long. Hallelujah. You can read that on your own throughout this week. Hallelujah. But let's read 1 Thessalonians 5, starting at verse 18. Here's what it says. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's so short, I can read it again. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is going to be a powerful time for you and I to get our arms wrapped around something that is so fundamental, it will, in a very sneaky way, get away from us and get us help to keep us off track, help to prevent us from getting on track. And I want us to get ready. Here, here, here's, here's, here's what I want us to do. I want us to chase the concept. Can we say thank you? Can we, can we give thanks to the Lord when there are challenging situations, when there are issues? And all we're going to do is call out about four things from this very scripture to see what we can see, how we can learn. First thing I want to call out from this particular scripture is give thanks. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. Two words, give thanks. First Thessalonians 5.18, kind of section A if we're going to break it up that way. Let's do it. First thing I want to do is give you a definition, a basic definition of thanks. Thanks says an expression of appreciation or gratitude or acknowledgement of services or favors given. That's just from a basic dictionary online. Nothing theologically deep. It is an expression of appreciation or gratitude or an acknowledgement of services or favors given. Here's what I want to call out about this. We associate commandments with the Ten Commandments. We associate because we're under grace, we don't associate a lot of commands, as it were, with the same weight when we were under the law. But this is different. This is almost like a New Testament command. As Paul is saying, this is what you must do. This is what you, if you're going to be a believer, if you're going to come into this life with Christ, this is not merely a suggestion. This is a, a, an admonishment. This is, has the weight of a command for you and I to understand that in everything, we, we, we need to be able to give thanks we need to make sure that our minds are focused. This is not something, again, that you and I do just out of the natural uh, overflow of our lives. Instead, it's quite the opposite. It, it's something that is, is it's, it's, we have to actually think on this. We have to purpose in our minds. It's not something we can do accidentally. It's not we can do happenstance. It's something that we have to set our minds on doing. Listen, when things close in on you and I, the natural predisposition that we have is set about to complain, to murmur, to be upset, to call out who wronged you and why they wronged you and why they're so horrible. When you and I get wronged in some way, when life throws us a curveball that we aren't quite pleased with, we have a tendency to begin to dissect it so that we can point blame. Because when we point blame, mom always told me, there's one finger going out, but there's three coming back. We have to make sure that we are in intentional and not just focusing on where we think the source of the issue is half the time we don't even know where the source is but instead we need to spend three times much energy and effort looking at ourselves to understand am I having the right attitude from the start am I walking in a spirit of gratitude am I thankful for what's going on even in spite of the challenges do I find myself being able to say Lord I thank you for whatever is going on, because it's not because I'm tied to you, I don't have to worry about the outcome ultimately. Just hold on to his hand and Lord, let me get through this with you as the focus. This is something that is willful. This is something that must be practiced. This is something that we have to cultivate as believers. 
Look at Psalm 34, one of our favorites. Lord have mercy. Look at what we believe David said. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. They humber shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I'll stop there before we get excited and start taking laps around here. Here's what you and I have to understand. There's no verbs in there that happen accidentally. There are verbs in there that you and I have to decide to do so that when things come up and they attack us, we have to say in spite of what's going on, I will intentionally and purposefully bless the Lord at all times. I will make sure that his praise is continually in my mouth. My soul, I will say, soul, you need to make sure and make your boast in the Lord. Don't boast in your money. Don't boast in your education. Don't boast in your relationships with other folks in high places. Make sure your soul is boasting in the Lord. We have to make sure that we magnify him. We have to exalt his name. We have to seek the Lord. He, I mean, this is all things that are intentional and purposeful and willful. Cannot simply be a victim when things happen to you and I, and we just find ourselves staying in a perpetual state of, of complaining, staying in a perpetual state of calling out who it is that wronged me, who it is that did me a certain way, who it is that did the dirt. You and I have to make sure that, yes, I understand humanity. I understand the hurt. I understand the pain. I get it. But please don't make that your sole destination when there's something wrong. Make sure you're able to stand up like Dave said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It must be purposeful. We have to give thanks. Number two, in all circumstances, it says give thanks in all circumstances. This one's a good one. Let's have some fun on this one. This is a good one. I love this one. Here's how I want to look at this. And we've said it here before. I've been here long enough where we've said some things and we're coming back to some fundamental concepts. The in perspective is different than the for perspective. What do you mean in perspective and for perspective? Here's what I'm saying. It says give thanks in all things, not for all things, right? This is what happens because naturally what we want to do is complain. That means giving thanks is not something that we can automatically do without practicing and thinking on it. So when something happens, when I say this concept of being grateful perpetually, we will, if we're not careful, we will end up making the mistake that says, God, I'm thanking you for whatever is causing me heartache and pain. This is not what we're saying. We're saying there's a difference between in a thing and for a thing. I'm not going to say, God, thank you that I lost my child. I'm not going to say, thank you, God, that my parent passed away. I'm not going to say, thank you, God, that this cancer came and you, you blessed me with cancer. No, 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 no. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that when you're in the thing, it actually accurately acknowledges what's going on. Sometimes we get accused as believers of walking in blind faith, that, that was, that's what God calls us to do. Couldn't be further from the truth. We know exactly what's going on. You know the heartache better than anyone. You can tell your story better than anyone. But guess what? God knows your heartache as well. And so there is a distinct difference between the end of a thing and the four of a thing. I don't want us to sit up and pray Praise God for things that are tearing up our hearts. Praise God for things that are ripping us apart. Praise God for things that are hurting us tremendously. That's not what I'm asking you to do. But instead, what I'm asking you to do is to remember this. Thanks while you are in, uh, uh, thanks while you're in a thing. Let me, let me say this right. Thanks while you're in a thing is the pathway of praise that will lead you properly out. <laughs> Thanks. Being able to say thank you, Lord, while we're going through a situation is a pathway of praise that will help lead us out. This, this is this is I mean, it sounds so fundamental. See, when 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 mama and grandma and great grandma and them and auntie them was checking you and I when we were small and we would fail to to, to practice being grateful that we would fail to say thank you, we would 
fail to not walk in gratitude, they knew something almost instinctively that we did not know. I believe it was the spirit of God helping them to understand that we've got to get a grasp on walking in gratitude, that if we fail to, we're going to miss out on some things. See, when we're in it and it is just killing us and pulling us apart, if we're able to say, thank you, Lord, in spite of what's happening, that leads to us being able to get properly out of a thing. Go to Philippians 4. Six, listen at what this says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart's and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's read that again. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Listen, we got to have not only the ability to ask God what we need help with, but listen, as we make the prayers and the petitions, we've got to make sure we understand that we need his peace. And as we're going through hell and high water situations in our lives, we have to be able to walk things out so that even when things are turning us topsy-turvy, we have the ability to be anchored in him. And it comes in part. Notice it says here, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. That's not an option. So some of us know how to pray for the thing that we think we need, but we forget to be grateful in the situation. We forget to that in spite of that. Okay, thank you, Lord. I appreciate the fact that now I have a fight on my hands because I'm attached to you. This doctor just told me I have cancer. Guess what? Thank you that I have a doctor. Thank you that I have someone that can name the problem. Here's why. Because once you name it, I know there's a name that's above every name. So while he named cancer, I'm naming Jesus. So while he named uh, foreclosure, I'm naming Jesus. While he names bankruptcy, I'm naming Jesus. There is a God that sits high and looks low and is interested in us, not only asking for what we have need of, which he already knows in the first place, but he's also looking for you and I to walk in a spirit of gratitude. <laughs> If he never does another thing, he's already done enough. If he never shows up again for you and I, he's already done enough. If he doesn't answer one more prayer, he has already done enough. But the formula, the piece of the formula that is missing with many of us is gratitude. We have to give thanks in all situations, all circumstances, no matter what's happening don't just pray for what you want pray for what you want with thanksgiving point number three for this is God's will for you oh boy here we go for this is God's will for you how can I say this give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you and I when it comes to God Obedience is its own reward. That's first and foremost. I know you want to have a breakthrough in your situation. I know you want God to stop the pain. I know you want God to heal whatever is hurting. I know there's a wayward child who you're concerned about that you keep praying Year after year, I know there's a wayward spouse that you're saying, Lord, please speak to their hearts. I know there's a family member that you're putting before the Lord continually and you want to see the evidence that God is answering your prayer and moving in their lives. I know there's a situation that you're walking through right now that you're standing in the need of a miracle from God, an answer from Almighty Father that, that you're looking for him to show you demonstratively that he is answering in the way that would help you through. I know that's what our goal is. That's natural. We want the thing to be fixed. We want the issue to be addressed. But guess what? That's not what's first. What's first is if God says for you and I to be thankful and to operate in the spirit of gratitude, that's what has to be done first. Walking in obedience because obedience to God is absolutely its own reward. 
we kind of downplay that. We want to check off all the things that we need to do so that we can rightfully ask God and get him to affirm. You know how I used to do. Uh, 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 Mama, can I go outside? Okay, did you clean your room? Did you clean your, and which, what we'll do, we'll get smart after a while. Mama, I cleaned my room. I, I cleaned the bathroom. I vacuumed like you said. I even took out the trash. Now, can I go outside? See, we get smart about it, and we try to anticipate what mama going to say so that we can get the desired outcome. And that's how some of us in our immaturity come to God saying, listen, God, I've been tithing. I've been giving. Lord, I've been going to church. Lord, I've been reading your word. Lord, I've been fasting and praying. Lord, I've been making sure I did not say certain things when folks cut me off on the freeway. Lord, I've been doing all the things that you said I should do. Lord, in spite of even how I felt sometimes. Lord, I kept being obedient to you now, Lord. I want you to take this thing away. I want you to heal this thing. I want you to help my heart to get better. Lord, stop these tears from, from falling down my face. Lord, I want you to do whatever this thing is. Sometimes, like when Paul and Jesus himself prayed to God repeatedly, he did not necessarily change what they were asking for. And the celebration came when they were just being obedient. Jesus said it best, nevertheless, thy will be done, not my will. See, the reward is the obedience itself first. But I'm so glad we serve a God who is not just a dictator like that, but is also interested in giving us some good things while we're in the land of the living. And so Thanksgiving has some benefits. Being grateful has some benefits that I want you to understand. I was just reading a, a Forbes article because there are study after study, literally, literally study after study that shows the demonstrative benefits of walking in gratitude. Here's what this particular article in Forbes said. Gratitude enhances empathy and reduces aggression. Come on, y'all. Hear me. Married folk. Hear me. Come on. He hallelujah. Come on here. Come on. Come back. Listen to me. Gratitude enhances empathy, the ability to feel for others, right? The ability to feel, actually, to feel with others. Sympathy is feeling for others. Empathy is feeling with them, the ability to effectively get in their shoes. Gratitude enhances empathy and reduces aggression. Grateful people are more likely to behave in a pro-social manner even when others behave less kind, according to a 2012 study by the University of Kentucky. Study participants who ranked higher on gratitude scales were less likely to retaliate against others, even when given negative feedback. They experienced more sensitivity and empathy toward other people and a decreased desire to seek revenge. Hmm? It is not simply just a spiritual thing. It is not just some command, random command from God. Listen, there is a, a psychological, physiological, biological response that takes place when we cultivate the discipline of walking in gratitude and making sure that, yes, we acknowledge what's going on accurately, but we find the silver lining. We practice saying, thank you, Lord. Well, I see this over here, but Lord, I can call out the fact that there's something about this situation I can say thank you for because it could always be worse. God wants you and I to walk with a spirit of contentment, not complacency. Hear me. And it's all in him. I, I, I want to be clear on this. We want to walk in a spirit of contentment, not complacency. And we're doing all of this in him. Let's go to first Timothy six. This is so good. By the time we eat turkey or vegan turkey, whatever your choice is, we're going to have a handle on Thanksgiving. We're going to have a handle on it. Listen to what 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8 says. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For listen, we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, <laughs> we will be content with that. In our chase to get more, if we can temper that with the spirit of contentment, Understanding that we came in with nothing. We're, I don't care how much stuff your friends 
put in your casket, <laughs> right? I don't care how much they, they drop in there for the journey. Crazy. Aren't we crazy? <laughs> right? Putting stuff in there. Let me put this in here with them. Let me, let me, come on, please, get out of here. When we in that casket, trust me, the last thing we're thinking about is what our friends and family put inside of a casket. But having said that, when we're, when we're there, we're, we're not taking anything out with us. We have to be really aware that if we're blessed to have food, if we're blessed to have clothing, we are far ahead of another number of folks on this world, in this world, on this planet. We have to keep an awareness that we are so tremendously blessed. So what? You don't have the house that you want. So what? You're not driving the car that you prefer. So what? You don't have every situation and every dynamic laid out the way your mind can envision it. That is not what is central to the cause. It is walking in contentment. And then finally, in Christ Jesus, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you. In Christ Jesus, as we prepare to close right now, I want us to think on the following. This is a benefit for us. When I say us, I mean those who are in the family of faith. But I have a sneaky suspicion if you practice this, even if you weren't a follower of Christ, because there are some concepts that are just concepts. And if you follow them, you're good. But in this instance, for sure, most certainly, membership has its privileges. We can never forget about the good news, as it were. And this is what I mean, that Christ came, died, he was buried, he arose, he um, appeared, he ascended, and he's coming back again. That is the good news. And here's what we've got to do. No matter what life throws our way, we have to be able to say, thank you, Lord, even when things are going out of control, because in those critical moments, we are tempted to do other than that. And when we do other than that, we become less than effective witnesses for Christ. It, 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 is, it, is, it is absolutely imperative that we get this. This is not a thing where just when you're feeling good, you say thanks. Just when you get something that's favorable to you, you say thanks. It is us practicing that discipline no matter what's going on. Go to Hebrews 13, 15 as we prepare to close. Here's what it says. Through Jesus, remember, in Christ Jesus, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. You got to be in Jesus to walk in this in its most fullest and here's what I love. As you and I remember the gospel, remember the good news, we're challenged to open up our mouth. It's another example. When we were doing our second worship song and I came back and said, hey, wait a second, let's shake ourselves. I'm not just saying that because it's a, a, a cultural preference. I'm not saying it because I just want us to act a certain way and everyone to be like, your expression of praise, your expression of gratitude, your expression of thanksgiving is going to be as unique as your DNA. But what that means is you're called even more to do it, right? We have no two snowflakes that are alike, and they are so beautiful and unique coming from a Southern California kid who's never seen one in life, but I'm told such. Part of the, the power of this thing is that they look totally different. And God commands of you and I. He commands. We've got to get this right. There are some folks that are very frustrated on this morning because of recent events. There are some folks that are celebrating on this morning. And I don't care who you are. We are going to find ourselves in situations because, I mean, the mere fact that we are believers, we are going to line ourselves up for persecution. And whether we are being celebrated or being tolerated, you and I have to be able to say, thank you, Lord. 
when, when the, the, the money is funny and the change is strange, you and I have to be able to say, thank you, Lord. When our boss does not act right and we start to feel that, you know, that funny feeling like I think I might have to start. I'm going to have to go over to LinkedIn or somewhere. Right. And, and get my my stuff updated because I think I might have to make a move. And you start to feel that, you know, you know, that feeling. Right. Can I, do I have enough in savings? How long? OK, I got about two months worth. And you start like you have to be able to in spite of going going and doing all of that, you have to be able to find the silver lining to say, thank you, Lord. That I'm aware of what's happening. Can you and I practice the discipline of when something terrible happens? That we can still say, thank you, Lord. I heard of uh, a family that had a son, precious son to them. He grew, decided to become a part of the military services. And as is the case in those instances, there are times when individuals offer their greatest sacrifice in the name of protecting the liberty and freedom of our country. And if you're a veteran, veteran, God bless you. God bless you. If you're in active service, God bless you. We, we, we love you and we recognize the great sacrifice. And as, as was the case in this instance, this individual lost their life in service of their country. And a minister had to meet with the family and, and could not imagine what to say to them. 21 years old, gunned down. Here's what the minister said. Can you thank God for the fact that you had him for 21 years? What about the mom that carried a child to term and shortly after giving birth, the child passed away? What, what about the child that is senselessly murdered? What, what about the, the young person who is, who is gunned down randomly? By your, can, can you say thank you that you had him for 21 years and that he decided to, to walk in a call that was bigger than any of us and he made an ultimate sacrifice. Can you, can you be thankful that someone came to you and let you know exactly what was going on? Can you be thankful that, that he's going to walk in dignity even in the process of being buried? Listen, folks, this is what we're talking about, a mature version of ourselves that aren't satisfied with just having the outcome come out like we want it to. See, those parents can't, pray for God. Well, they can pray for him, but most likely he's not going to get up right now. But by holding on to gratitude and acknowledging the pain right where they are, they can also put something else in place that would help not only them, but others who are walking with them and seeing their lives. It's my prayer that as we spend the next few weeks, you would come back and we would continue to unpack thanksgiving, gratitude, contentment together because God has a lot to say about it. Here's the application challenge for this week. I want you to uh, continue to get involved. Now, that's not going to change. Continue to get involved with local government even more, even more. The wave campaign, keep that going. When you see people wave, say hi, even through your mask. I want you to spend 30 minutes with God. If you haven't done that, if you're not in that habit, develop that habit. I want you to continue to spend time learning not just the Bible, but about the Bible. And then here's the new one for this week specifically, the three by three gratitude exercise. Here we go. Here, Pastor, here you go. Always want us to do something. Well, that's what God wants us to do. Since God commanded us to do it, and since there is study after study that challenges us with experiencing uh, benefits of walking in gratitude, here's what I want you to do for the next several, every single day as we're through this series. I want you to three times a day, if you can anywhere, write down three things you're grateful for. So maybe when you first wake up. I want you to write down three things that you're grateful for. It could be anything. I'm grateful for my eyebrows. <laughs> 
right? I've seen, ladies, I've seen you spend a great deal of time on eyebrows, right? There's some of you that are blessed that have that whole little thing that, you know, you know what I mean? And so whatever it is, randomly, you just put it. Three things that you're grateful for in the morning, in the noon, and then at night before you go to bed. Three by three, three by three gratitude exercise. Three times a day, three things written down. Hear me. Don't just say it. Write it down. You can write it down in the note section on your phone. You can write it on a little journal. Just write it somewhere. Preferably someplace you can come back to and, and refer back to and look at. Right? Practice this this week. Starting this week. Right? Every single day. It doesn't take a long time three by three gratitude exercise. Amen. And finally, I want to thank you. I'm going to pray and then we're going to close out. I want to thank you for joining in with us. I'm about to pray. And when we pray, we will just say goodbye. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in with us. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you in the name of Jesus for you being the kind of God that you are. That Lord, you knew there would be heartaches and pain in our lives. But you gave us something very, very strategic, very applicable, very practical, that if we can just practice this discipline, cultivate it, that, Lord, no matter what is getting thrown our way, we have a pathway of praise that will get us to a better destination in you, whether you change it how we want it changed or whether you don't, because our focus is on you. Help us to make thanksgiving and gratitude and contentment not merely relegated to a season of the year, but that, Lord, we would demonstrate it as believers all throughout. Every single day. Lord, I specifically pray that all that are under the sound of my voice, both right now and in the future, that they would do the three by three gratitude exercise. Literally do it. Prompt them to just walk in obedience, Lord, I pray. And then, Lord, as they do that, reveal to them, unfold yourself to them. Help them to experience your spirit at a deeper dimension. For those that don't know you in the part of the sin, Lord, help them to understand that you came, you died, you were buried, you arose, you appeared, you ascended, and you're coming back again. And if they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, they will be saved. And they can make a change. We'll be so careful to give your name all the praise, honor, and glory that it deserves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. Please know that College Park and our Lord and Savior love you. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. God bless you. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>